hello everyone, Bridget Ayer here um, with All About the Grace, and I have actually a repeat guest, Stephen O'Keefe, who is an Acts apologist. He uh, has been teaching high school Bible study for 10 years now, and he mainly um, kind of just takes questions and kind of breaks open the word. So welcome to All About the Grace, Stephen. It's good to be here. So I've been wanting to do this um, Skype slash online Zoom kind of thing with Stephen, um, and he always likes to do it in person, but now since we're social distancing, we have to do it online, so I'm excited to do it like this. But One time, huh? Yes, yes. So we're going to, um, our topic today is preparing for Holy Week, and when I asked Stephen to do uh, another interview with me, I always like to ask him questions, and he said, well, I said, well, what topic do you want to do? And he said, he sent me all these scriptures and homework and all this stuff, but I'm like, oh my gosh, but it's all good. So um, we're going to be reflecting on the gospel narrative of the passion. And so, um, but before we get to that, I want to ask you, Stephen, how do we, how, how are Catholics should we approach reading scripture? Because sometimes people say it's just really hard to do. Yeah. Well, the most important thing uh, is in, in the advice of uh, dentists, you ask them what's the best toothpaste to use. And they say <laughs> it's the one that you do use. So the best way to approach reading scripture is just to, uh, to approach reading scripture is just to do it. Um, you know, if it's, if it's a thing on your to, to do list, you'll never get to it. And so I think the most important thing to do is just to sit down with the gospel and to open it up. And then, you know, the gospels, they have their own style. They have the way that they say things. And that takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, but I think the most important thing is just to sit down and read it through in one whole chunk. Uh, go to the gospel of Matthew. Uh, the, the passion narratives are found in starting in Mark 14, Matthew 26, Luke 22, and John 18. And just to pick one, sit down with it, read through it from beginning to end, and then maybe go to the next one. Um, what I've been doing this Lent as I've been leading Bible studies on YouTube is I've been actually copying each one into you know Microsoft Word or whatever it is, and um, finding out how they all piece together. That's been my little project. Mm -hmm. One of the Gospels tells a different part of the Passion Narrative story they all tell the same outline, but they all contain little details that fit together almost like a detective story, trying to figure out how they all fit together. Um, so so that's my joy, is, so, is seeing that. So why don't you go through then and give us the basic layout of what happens in the passion narratives, like just, just the, the yeah. point by point what happens. Okay, so we start as Jesus cuts the Passover meal short the last supper and he goes out to the garden of gethsemane um and then he prays uh to god to please uh take this away from him uh because as a normal well, not a normal human being but as a human being he doesn't want to be tortured to death which is a normal human thing to not want mm -hmm. uh, then uh judas comes and he has a brief confrontation with judas and then he has a confrontation with the crowd that's come to arrest him um, one of his disciples, whom we find out in the Gospel of John, um, uh, is Peter, uh, strikes one of the servants and, uh, and cuts off his ear. Uh, then Jesus is led away to Annas, the previous high priest. He was the high priest um, in like from like 6 to 11 AD. Uh, so he gets led off to Annas first in the middle of the night. And then he's led off to the house of Caiaphas where he spends the night and in the morning we have the trial before the Sanhedrin. After the trial before the Sanhedrin, they go off with Pilate, and they explain why uh, they brought Jesus to him. Pilate is having basically none of it, and um, he talks to Jesus for a little bit, then sends him to Herod Antipas, who is the same guy who had John the Baptist killed. Herod um, thinks of Jesus as sort of an oddity, uh, someone who he wants to see perform for him. Uh, Jesus doesn't respond to him, so Herod sends him back to Pilate again. And so uh, Pilate is, um, again, he's fed up with this situation already, and he's not sure what the deal is with this guy. He's trying to get out of it, basically. So he sees if the crowd will be satisfied with just 
flogging Jesus. So he does that. It doesn't work. They still want him dead. And so then after he realizes that it's futile, he hands Jesus over to be crucified. Jesus is on his way outside the city of Jerusalem. Um, he uh, apparently can't hold his cross very well. So they re replace him with Simon the Cyrene. He gets out to the spot where he's going to be nailed to the cross and crucified. And, uh, and the rest, you know. So I want to talk about, and one of the things that Stephen had given me <laughs> to read, which he talked about how he's been kind of um, reading scripture um, throughout Lent, was comparing, so, so he laid out for me <laughs> the, the, the passion narrative, which each of, so he took all the different gospels and laid it all out for me. So, so it was really kind of cool to see like the whole story, but from all the different gospels. But yeah. before, before we get into those specific gospel accounts, could you kind of just give us a quick, <laughs> a quick, here's my, here's my timer. A oh, quick, <laughs> we used that in our first, our first interview that we did. But our quick, a quick overview, kind of the perspective that Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John kind of approach, I guess, how they've written their, their Gospels, if that makes sense. So yeah. go ahead. So, um, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels because they famously cover a lot of the same material. Uh, and then John seems like he's just coming from a completely different tradition if you read most of the gospel. Now, once you get out of the Last Supper, really all four of them are describing the same sequence of events. Um, John is, he's filling in a lot of material that wasn't there in the previous three. So there's certain events which only John talks about, such as, uh, and, and his is a, has a lot more spiritual reflections in it. Um, so, for instance, he alone talks about the water and the blood coming out of the side of Christ after he's uh, killed. He alone is the one who makes the direct comparison of Jesus being the sacrificial uh, Passover lamb. He's, so he alone is the one who has had the time to reflect on these things and include those little, um, those little vignettes. He also is the only one who tells you that Jesus went straight to Annas, the former high priest. Um, Luke is sometimes thought to be the one who focuses more on healings. And so Luke is the only one who mentions that Jesus healed the ear of the high priest after he was, uh, after he was cut. Um, Matthew and Mark, um, in their own way, try to make it clear that Jesus is in charge of things. Matthew alone includes the line, this awesome line from Jesus, where he says, you know, if I wanted, could I not call down 10 legions of angels to defend me right now? Mm -hmm. um, John also has this other business where, when the crowd comes to arrest Jesus, he speaks the divine name, I am. And it says that everyone is knocked down when he says that. Um, so they, they each have their own little details. Um, it's somewhat difficult to place a different theme on each one since they're all telling the same story. But I do mm -hmm. think that John has the most spiritual reflection in it. Uh, Luke is the most uh, focused on sort of the healing and redemptive qualities that are for Gentiles. He is also the only one who has the, the thief, that the good thief that says, um, um, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And uh, Matthew and Mark are really just laying out um, the character of Jesus as a Jewish high priest as he's going through this Passover, uh, this very strange Passover sacrifice that he's making. So um, now you touched on it a little bit, but do you want to go into uh, more detail about the unique features about each of, of the Gospels and in, in the Passion narrative? Yeah, sure. Um, so again, um, let's see. I have some of them written down here. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so at the, let's see. Yeah, so in, in uh, John's Gospel, that's the one where after Judas comes, Jesus says, uh, I am to the crowd and it knocks them to the ground. Um, in Luke's gospel, it says that uh, Malchus, the, the high priest servant, is healed. Then in John's gospel alone, it says that he goes to Annas, the, high, uh, the former high priest, first. Um, in Mark's gospel, when Jesus is being questioned, and this is a really crucial thing, Jesus is asked, are you the son of the Most High? 
And then Jesus repeats the, the divine name again, I am. And then he quotes Daniel 7 saying, and you will see the Son of Man coming down in the power of, uh, on the clouds. And that's crucial because Mark is the earliest gospel. And sometimes you'll hear people say that, that John's gospel is the only one that really definitively portrays Jesus as God. Um, he's the only one where he claims to be God. But if you read Mark's gospel, it comes through loud and clear uh, that Jesus absolutely positively claimed to be God in front of these people by saying, I am, and you will see the Son of Man coming in power. Um, let's see, John's gospel contains, um, uh, actually, Luke's gospel, again, contains the uh, the business about the good thief repenting, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, which is wonderful, which is a wonderful story that, uh, that we have. Um, I believe it's Mark's gospel is the only one that has the detail about Simon Cyrene having to help Jesus on the way of the cross. Uh, John's gospel is the only one that includes the interactions with Mary, the mother of Jesus, where Jesus um, says, uh, behold your mother, behold your son. Uh, that's John? That's John. Um, and then John also is the one that includes Jesus being pierced in the side, and having the flow of water and blood, which represent the sacraments. Um, so that's why I came up with the idea of doing the compilation approach as I do my Bible studies, mm -hmm. is because if you only read one of them, you really miss out on so much cool stuff that the other ones saw fit to, to include. Well, let me ask you this, and I was thinking about this, and I didn't, I didn't look, at, look it up before we get started, and I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but right. which, which, um, yeah, <laughs> I know you love these questions. Which one are we going to be reading for this? Oh, <laughs> you got me. You got me. I, I, I don't, don't actually know which one we're reading. Coming I don't know. And, 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 and that's one thing that is also really interesting is that I would always wonder why, you know, in some versions you'd have the one that always really struck out, stuck out to me was the one where, um, Peter cuts off the one the servant's ear. Yeah. That um and then and then Jesus all of them heals say it. That. But all but of them, all of them mention it. Only John says it was Peter. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. I don't know why. Maybe I remember hearing that it was Peter, and then every time you hear it from from there on, you know, I know it's Peter. But the but but it's Luke is the one where Jesus picks up the ear and heals the ear, right? Yeah. It says that it says that Jesus. Jesus tells them to stop, and then it says, and he healed the, he, he healed the servant, and then he moves on. Yeah. And, and but that, but, mentions the healing. But that scene in, in, in all of, of the, um, of the gospel, of the, of the passion mm -hmm. narrative, you know, I guess that's leading up to it, I guess, um, or part of it. But that scene, for some reason, in, as a kid, always stuck out in my mind, the one about him healing the ear and I, I, don't, I don't that just kind of struck me um as i read through it again so what what let's talk about um the different characters as in um kind of the evolution or maybe not the evolution but talk about each of the um maybe the motivations of each person you got pilot um caiaphas is that how you say it caiaphas yeah um, Judas and Peter. So I know you had some reflections on each one of those kind of and, and, and what happened to them and what their motivations were. So let's, let's start with yeah. Pilate. Okay. Um, oh, and by the way, we're, I just looked it up. We're doing Matthew's gospel. Okay. <laughs> this, this year. Okay. So yeah, let's start with Pilate because he plays so prominently in it and he's such an interesting uh, character to study. And honestly, because of how much character they, they give him in the gospels, uh, he probably is the one I relate to most. Um, so he is, he's the governor of Judea at the time, and he's been in the job for seven years. And by this time, he is sick to death of these people. Uh, he's a Roman, and he, he is not happy with the Sanhedrin. He doesn't like their culture. He doesn't like their monotheism. He doesn't like how particular they are and how he has to leave the Praetorium so they can talk to him because they don't think they can enter. And so he's, he starts off the encounter already sick of these people and looking to get out of, you know, having to do this. Yeah. Um, because in his mind, Jesus is just some weirdo. Mm -hmm. um, he asked Jesus, are you a king? And he goes on about like, well, I'm the, I'm a king. I'm not of this world. My kingdom is a kingdom of truth. 
and Pilot goes out and he's like, yeah, stop wasting my time with this guy. Um, and so, but after Jesus comes back from Herod, uh, Pilot receives a message from his wife saying that she had had a premonition in a dream about Jesus. And she said, have nothing to do with this innocent man. All right. So at this point, Pilate is confronted with this guy who says that he is a king of a different world. His wife had a premonition about him. He's probably heard by now that Jesus was some kind of miracle worker. And then in John's gospel, it says that when, when he hears from the people uh, from the Sanhedrin, that Jesus was claiming to be the son of God, it actually says at that point, Pilate became very worried. And he drags Jesus back into the praetorium and he asks him, where are you from? And he already knows that he's a Galilean. So at this point, Pilate is concerned that he's about to kill the son of a God. You know, he's a, he's a Roman pagan. He knows about, you know, these, these myths about divine human hybrids. And he's concerned he's about to get on the bad side of the gods by killing one of their children. Um, and so Pilate, by the end of the encounter with Pilate, he's almost scared of Jesus and he's looking to get out of this situation without pissing off the gods. Um, and so, and then he, he kind of washes his hands of the thing, quite literally. And he says, you know, I'm guilty of this. I'm, I'm innocent of this man's blood. He wants to get out of here without, without accruing any guilt. Now, he, he still has guilt. He sentenced the innocent man to die. He didn't do the right thing. But he's such an interesting character uh, because he starts off annoyed that he has anything to do with this. And he ends terrified that he has anything to do with this. Um, so that's the character of Pilate for you. So I'll come back to why you think you relate to him the most. That was another question, but let, let's go to the um, let's go to the next one. Um, is it Caiaphas? Yeah. So Caiaphas is at the time the uh, reigning high priest. It says that he is the high priest that year uh, for the first thirty years of um, of from AD one to AD thirty three. There was something like four or five different high priests, and. Caiaphas, he, I believe it's in John uh, 10 or 11, he states his motivations, which is that he thinks that Jesus uh, claiming to be the Messiah is going to drive people into a kind of messianic fervor, and they're going to get into a war with the Romans. And he correctly predicts that war, war with the Romans is going to be a disaster, and that they're all going to get killed. Um, so his, uh, his line in, in John's gospel is, better that one man should die for the whole country than for all of us to die. And it's a, it's a really interesting detail that John includes there. It says he prophesied without knowing because he was the high priest. So despite being the high priest, or rather, despite planning the death of the son of God, the fact that he had that office of high priest meant that God was going to use him despite his not knowing, which actually says a bit about us as Catholics, as we have the papacy, you know, we have, um, our high priest is Jesus, but the papacy is an office established by God that has certain protections. And we can ask ourselves, well, what does God do with bad popes? You know, what does God do with popes that are scoundrels and doing bad things? And you can actually look back to Caiaphas, who was literally putting the Son of God to death. And God still honored his position as high priest and made him prophesy. But that was Caiaphas' motivation was that he was thinking he was going to basically preserve Israel by getting rid of this messianic pretender who was going to get them all killed. And he was willing to do whatever it took to get to that end, even if it meant lying and putting Jesus through a, a sham trial. Uh, so he was, he was trying to you know, do, do good through evil. Uh, that was Caiaphas' motivation. Self, self-preservation? Uh, yeah, and that of himself and of the whole nation, at least in his understanding. Um, you know, in truth, if, if, uh, if he had let Jesus do what he wanted to do, if he had let Jesus assume the mantle of uh, Messiah, let's say hypothetically, well, Jesus had no interest in, you know, in starting a messianic uh, Davidic kingdom. He didn't want to start a revolution. So it's ironic that in the end, Caiaphas' rejection of Jesus is what ultimately brought the Romans down on, on, uh, on Israel. A good, interesting point. Okay, now let's go to Judas. 
Judas's motivations are the most mysterious and the most wondered after because so little is said about what he wanted to do. There's no real interview with, with Judas the way that some of these other people have speaking roles. Mm -hmm. uh, True. The most common understanding is that, well, it says in John's gospel that, that Judas was stealing from the, from the company purse. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, some people will see there that, well, maybe greed was his motivation. Um, it says that in John 6, that after the sermon, uh, the uh, bread of life discourse, that it's at that point that it says that uh, Judas was becoming disillusioned. So maybe Judas was, uh, he was expecting a secular Messiah and he wasn't getting that secular Messiah. Instead, he was getting this preacher who was spouting nonsense in his understanding. And he had sacrificed everything for this. So, you know, he just decides, I'm going to leave this thing. I'm going to leave this, this uh, band of crazy people. And I'm going to try to make some money on the way out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, that's my personal guess. Um, other people try to do him more justice. People try to give him more credit. But uh, I don't think the Gospels try to give him all that much credit. I think it's basically greed and disillusionment is uh, what I credit to Judas. And then Peter. Uh, Peter, of course, um, you know, Peter is really, he's a real go-getter, that <laughs> Peter. Um, you know, he tells all the way through the Gospels, he's always the first one to speak up. He's always the one to, to, to proclaim what's right. And um, he, he puts his foot in his mouth, you know, he, after Jesus said he was going to die uh, Peter is the one who calls him aside and says, nah, Jesus, that's not what's going to happen. You stop that crazy talk. Um, and then, of course, at the Last Supper, uh, Peter is the one who says, you know, even if all these other people run away, I won't run away. Um, and Jesus is like, yeah, we'll see about that. Um, now, Peter is also the one who strikes out at the sword at Malchus the servant. Um, and then sometimes his bravery gets short trip. Peter then goes with Jesus all the way to Caiaphas's house. And he's actually, it, when you put all the Gospels together, you see that Peter is in the courtyard of the high priest whose servant he just attacked with a sword. And sometimes, you know, priests will preach homilies about, oh, Peter, he was so brave, but now some servant girl is going to, is, is frightening him. But in truth, it wasn't just a servant girl that was frightening him. There was a whole crowd of people who were finding out who he was and what he did in the garden. And he's looking at this crowd of people and he's afraid of getting killed. Um, and as they're saying, hey, weren't you in the garden? No, you're one of his followers. And another person says, no, I'm pretty sure you were there. And, uh, and so he's petrified, um, no pun intended. And, um, <laughs> and so he, he gives into that fear. And it's a very understandable fear if you're in a crowd of people who might just kill you if they find out what you were up to not a half hour beforehand, uh, you might be scared too. Um, so that's what Peter is on about. And of course, he's very remorseful after he denies Jesus. Okay, so before we got started, I, I told Stephen that I had a couple a couple other questions that I wanted to ask. And, and one he's kind of alluded to, but um, so who can you relate to most in the story? Yeah, and, and I said Pilate because... Um, because I can understand his feeling of frustration. Um, his, his personality really comes through from the very beginning. You can feel his frustration with these people uh, that he's dealing with. And, you know, you can empathize with that. You know, if you're dealing with a very troubling group of people and you're just trying to just run things well for Caesar, you know, that's what you want to do. You just, you have a job and you want to do your job. And why do these people have to make your job, you know, just a living hell? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and at first Jesus is just some weirdo, you know, he's saying things that don't make sense. Like I'm, you know, my kingdom is of the truth and all those who know the truth know me. If I heard that, I'd be like, Looney. You know? <laughs> and that's his response. So then he just says, let someone else deal with this. And then finally he starts getting more clues about who this guy might be. And suddenly he realizes he's in over his head. And now he just wants to get out without incurring guilt before the gods. All of his motivations, I can really resonate with. I can, it just makes sense to me. He's such a well fleshed out character. In the end, he does the wrong thing, which, you know, I've done wrong things too. I've, I've made all kinds of um, uh, justifications for myself doing wrong things in my life too. And so, you know, Pilate is a guy who's trying in a weird way to, he starts off just trying to make his day go okay. 
-hmm. And at the end, he's trying to get out without incurring blame before the gods. And he doesn't even quite manage that. But yeah, I just, his character is the one that just makes the most sense to me as a guy who is an engineer and is pretty practical myself. Mm -hmm. And I just want my day to go smoothly too. <laughs> um, and so I, pilot makes a lot of sense to me. That's hilarious. Well, you know, when I was um, thinking about that question and I, I, I always can relate to Peter. I feel like I'm just like Peter. I'm always like, you know, I'm the one that would, cut the ear off, you know, draw my sword, and I'd be the one out there. But then I'd also be chicken and, like, running away. So, you know, but then in the end, I think I would do the right thing after I was chicken. So that's yeah. just, like, um, I, I've always been able to really relate to Peter. So um, it was interesting that those were the four um, characters that you had that you wanted to talk about. So I'm like, yeah, I can relate to Peter. So, and that's yeah. interesting that you could relate to pilot and, and that I, I could see that, you know, but I know in the end you'll, you do the right thing. Um, well, let me ask you this. So, so for people um, watching this and they're, you know, going into, into Holy week, um, what, what would be your advice in terms of how to best prepare um, for Holy Week and for Easter as we're coming coming up to that. Well, we're all kind of doing penance right now, aren't we? <laughs> True. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Bible geek. And so I think that it's just good. Um, I, I think that last time we spoke, you said, you know, what, what do you hope people get out of knowing the scriptures better? And I, I'm mm -hmm. sort of like, you know, that's kind of an end in and of itself. Knowing the scriptures better because it's God's word is something which is good enough just to do for its own sake. True. And what I would urge people to do is to read all four gospels, try to understand how they fit together, look at some maps uh, of, of Jerusalem, try to put yourself on the ground, see where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is, see where the Praetorium was, see where the Mount of Olives was. Really, don't let it just be a story to you, because that's how it was all my life. It was just words on a page that we read once a year. Look at the maps. Look where Jesus had to walk. And try to understand the story of Jesus going out to the cross for our salvation. And imagine it as a real thing. Think about the people who are doing these things. Think about their motivations. And um, just let it be part of a real world thing that happened in history and don't let it just be a thing that you read once that will actually get you here once a year um yeah i i went most of my early life without ever reading the gospels myself and i think that a lot of other people do the same thing and i just think it's so urgent just to crack open the bible and to just and to just just to sit with jesus for a while as and to journey with him as he goes through the passion in all four gospels um so again, that's Matthew chapter 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 18. Um, yeah, look at some maps for a while. Uh, look at some artwork. Read up on the characters involved. Um, can I tell you about something weird that I found out while I was uh, while I was reading the Gospel of John? Sure. So there's this really puzzling section of the Gospel of John. I mentioned that he goes to see Annas, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Annas is introduced to you as the father-in-law of the high priest, okay? So he's not the high priest. But in the very next sentence, they call Annas the high priest. And when Jesus kind of says to Annas, you know, why are you asking me what I was teaching? Wasn't I in the temple every day? Uh, the guard strikes him and says, is that how you speak to the high priest? And then it says, and then they put him in chains and took him off to the high priest. And I read that and was like, what? Yeah. That, like, how can it be that he was not, he was talking to the father-in-law of the high priest. Why is it then go on and say that he was talking to the high priest and then at the end say, oh, and then they took him to the high priest. That really puzzled me. Um, and so what I did was I started reading up on the characters and I said, well, maybe Annas had been the high priest. And this is sort of like one of those things when after a governor leads off, leaves office, Sometimes people continue to call him governor so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, I took to Wikipedia. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, <laughs> that reliable <laughs> source there. <laughs> yeah. 
it's a good place to start anyway. It is. And I found out that Annas had been the high priest, and then suddenly the scripture made more sense because they were doing that bit where you leave the office, but you still call the guy by his office. Um, so it, it really helps me to understand that what I'm looking at is real history mm-hmm. when I'm looking at the Gospels. I'm looking at things that actually happen, not just stories. And that for me is like the, a huge part of my mission as I talk to teenagers or anyone who's willing to listen is that the Gospels are real history, and it really describes what Jesus did for us. So I would just urge people, for its own sake, learn the, learn the Gospels, read the Word, and, uh, and let it be real. Find ways to help it be real for you. Let me ask you one more thing. Are you planning to um, watch The Passion of the Christ, or you prefer to read it? Oh, heavens. Um, <laughs> I, I watched it back in high school once. And, uh, and I thought to myself when I was done, you remember the movie Castaway? Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> the movie Castaway at the end, I was like, okay, I've seen it. I have now seen Castaway. And I am done with that movie Castaway now. I can check that box. The Passion of the Christ for me was like the same thing. It was like, okay, all right, I've now seen it. I, I now have all those images in my head forever. Yeah, true. And, uh, well, so, I, you know, I, I probably won't be watching The Passion of the Christ. I think maybe someday I'll watch it with, you know, with my boys when they're old enough. Right. Um, because it really shows the, the horrific nature of what Jesus suffered. Um, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it with just with the inspired text and not the inspired film. Um, I, I do appreciate that OLMC put the tabernacle out in front of the church. And so yeah. I think that I might spend some time in adoration out there uh, by the parking lot, um, given the time that we have. I yeah, think that would be a good way to spend the time. And, and there's definitely something different about um, reading scripture, just, just reading it right out of the Bible and versus even off, off of your phone. I really prefer to have the actual paper version because mm-hmm. I think I find that when I'm on my phone, even if I'm reading scripture on my phone or doing the breviary, I'll get a notification <laughs> and I, I, I invariably get interrupted when I'm on my phone. And so I've just pretty much, I know it's convenient. It's nice. Everything's there. And I've got a bunch of different Bibles on there, but um, I still prefer the actual paper version. So, but, but Stephen gave me some, some good homework and reading. So I'll be, uh, I, I really appreciate you some sending all homework. Yes. Well, Stephen O'Keefe, Axe Apologist, thanks so much for being my guest. We'll definitely do this. Maybe we can do this for the Easter, um, the Eastern yeah. Pentecost scripture. So, Yeah, and, and those of you who are listening, tune in to the, uh, go to the OLMC community page if you can. Yeah. And, uh, and check out the Bible studies I've been doing for Lent. Uh, you can follow along with me as, as I go through this compiled version that I've made. Um, it's, uh, it's really been a detective story, and I've loved putting it together. And, uh, and I hope that all of you will, um, will listen to that and follow along with the readings with me. And I can even, um, Stephen, I can even get a, a link to your YouTube channel and link it up to, to this video in the description so people can just go to the description and get that. So, well, Stephen O'Keefe, um, we'll do this again, okay? Yeah, thank you so much, Bridget, for having me. All right, you bet. God bless. All right.